It's a Mailbag Monday. We've got your questions about Luis Matos of the San Francisco Giants, Kiner Delgado of the New York Yankees, and who might be the next Lars Newtbar. Let's talk about it. You are Locked On MLB Prospects, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Yes, welcome on in to Locked on MLB Prospects, your home for all things minor league baseball. I'm your host, Lindsey Crosby, freelance baseball writer and podcaster. Thank you for making this your first listen every single day. We're probably part of the Locked on Podcast Network, and today's episode is brought to you by BetterHelp. BetterHelp connects you with a licensed therapist who can take you on that journey of self-discovery from wherever you are. Visit BetterHelp.com slash LockedOnMLB today to get 10% off your first month. So as we do every single Monday, this is a mailbag episode. All of the questions in this show come from listeners of the show. If you have a question for our Mailbag Monday, I'm on Twitter at Crosby Baseball. Show's on Twitter at Locked on Farm. You can email us, LockedOnMLBProspects at gmail.com, or drop your questions in the Locked on MLB Prospects Discord. Links in the episode description, links in the show notes. First one, coming out of the Discord from Cam He asked about Luis Matos of the San Francisco Giants, a guy that we talked about briefly last year. I got some kind of key details wrong about it when we did, so making up for that right here. But 2018 IFA, the thing about Luis Matos is he's completely healthy finally. He had a quad injury last year, missed a lot of time, and so the numbers for 2022 weren't that great. Uh, He spent, I mean, he, he was in high A, he spent some time in the Arizona Fall League. But right now, uh, 47 games this season started off in AA Richmond and did so well he went up to AAA Sacramento and the numbers got better. So the combined slash line for Luis Matos in those 47 games, 344, 415, 492. Four home runs, 18 extra base hits, 22 walks to 18 strikeouts and 13 of 18 on stolen bases. I mentioned he's been better in AAA Sacramento. In those 16 games that he's been there, entering Sunday, I don't have su- uh, Sunday stats yet. They haven't played at time of recording. Luis Matos, 405, 443, 568. One home run, eight extra base hits. Two of those are triples. Five walks to six strikeouts and four or five on stolen bases. So, offensively, he has f- done just about everything right that you could ask for between AA and AAA. So in 2023, uh, he has gone from hitting too many fly balls and too many ground balls to just n- drilling line drives. So improvement there already. The walks are definitely there. You heard me say the full year slash line. He had more walks than strikeouts. 22 walks to 18 strikeouts. Uh, the plate discipline is there. He's not He's not chasing. Uh, he, he's doing a really good job of pitch recognition. And so he's hitting for a high average, 304 on the season, 405 in AAA. And specifically, recently has done very well, stringing together multiple hit games after multiple hit game after multiple hit game. So very impressed with what Luis Matos is doing offensively. Now, defensively, I think he can play all three positions. A majority of his starts this year have been in center field. He's also played left and right. Uh, I do think that he would be fine in center field. He's going to be an above average defender in a corner. He's probably going to be average to maybe above average in center. But the big thing here, and the reason why I think you should be excited about Luis Matos, is the Giants have been willing to be aggressive with some of their guys as far as getting them to the bigs early. And let's go through the list of debuts and stuff this year. Blake Sable, Rule 5 draftee. He had like 25 games in AAA. They put him on the opening day roster. He's been there the whole time. Uh, Brett Wisely has, like, did not have a ton of games in AAA when they got him from the Rays. Uh, Casey Schmidt is up. I think he had like 65 total games between AA and AAA. Um, And and Patrick Bailey. Uh, what is it? He had maybe maybe 28 games combined between AA and AAA before they called him up. The reliever Ryan Walker had like 22 appearances in AAA when he came up. And so they're moving the kids kind of fast. And everybody's watching Kyle Harrison. He's the top prospect. Everybody's waiting to see when he debuts. 
But Luis Matos is the one who I think ha- we have to also acknowledge has a really good chance. Now, the issue you have with Luis Matos is playing time, right? When you called up Casey Schmidt, it made sense because Brandon Crawford was hurt and you didn't really have another true shortstop on the roster. Uh, Bailey got the call because Joey Bart was hurt. You would really scary Sanchez. And I think Roberto Perez was also hurt maybe. But even with Michael Conforto out right now, there's a lot of depth in center field. Mike Yastrzemski can play it. Austin Slater can play it. Wisely can do it. Bryce Johnson can do it. You've got Sable who's out there who can play a corner outfield. Mitch Hanniger can play some corner outfield. And so even if Michael Conforto is out for a little while, uh, you don't have an immediate path to playing time for Luis Montos. But when the trade deadline comes, I believe, I think I think Jock's on a one-year deal. Conforto has an opt-out. If, he's a, if he comes back from the injury as hot as he's been, he's a candidate to get moved because if not, you get virtually nothing left for him. And so Matos is a good, like he's going to have to go on the 40-man roster at the end of this season anyway. So he's a good candidate to get called up if some guys move out at the trade deadline. Now, obviously you have plenty of time until that. So who knows uh, what's going to happen there as far as uh, contention, what that looks like. But if you have to bring an outfielder up from the minors, I like the idea of bringing up Luis Montos. Uh, Sneaky Turtle in our Discord asked about Kinder Delgado, shortstop for the New York Yankees. We don't normally get into DSL guys a lot. I've got a couple names for you. I'm going to point you to some resources. But Delgado is somebody that stands out to me. So 2021 IFA, he got 52 games in the DSL last year. And it's the DSL, so there's always grain of salt, sample size stuff with all of this. But in those 52 games, 310, 504, 506 slash line. Three home runs, 23 extra base hits, 58 walks to 28 strikeouts, and 34 of 42 on stolen bases. Some of those numbers don't sound correct. I know. 58 walks to 28 strikeouts, that doesn't sound correct. When I checked, that's correct. 34 stolen bases in 52 games, That doesn't sound correct. That's correct. And that's part of the reason why I'm like, let's pay attention to Kiner Delgado. Now, uh, we don't have super detailed scouting reports from the DSL. Or at least I don't. Uh, But there's some things you can immediately tell just from a little bit of film, as well as some of the write-ups that we do have, is uh, he has a very good hit tool, right? 79.8% contact rate. So... Very, very good at not missing pitches when he swings. The plate discipline, obviously it's good. You see the 58 walks to 28 strikeouts. You all also, when you dig into some of the numbers, chase rate of only 20%. So very good plate discipline. Now, power potential, always a question with guys in the DSL. He's listed at 5'7", 145. That's probably not correct because DSL measurements never are, but... You have to think there's a little bit of space to bring in some power, but you're looking at an infielder who, if what we have seen in the DSL is uh, positively projected forward, you have a guy who's going to give you a very good batting average and on-base percentage, is going to be quite a stolen base threat, and should be able to grow into some power. So keep an eye on him this year. Couple other names to watch. Uh, found in Celestin, the shortstop for the Mariners. Uh, outfielder Brailer Guerrero, the Tampa Bay Rays. Love the massive power. Doesn't fit their outfield profile. They've always gotten good defenders. He's going to be limited to a corner, but massive masher, so watch for him. Outfielder Luis Guanipa, the Atlanta Braves. Really speedy center fielder. Feels like he can add some power, has a good hit tool. Some guys to watch out for. But if you want more info about Uh, complex league players, DSL players to watch, especially for fantasy. Fantasy Fantasy-oriented, actually. Mostly ignoring the defense and talking about the offensive potential. Go check out Chris Clegg in the Dynasty Dugout. Uh, It's on Substack. You can just search Dynasty Dugout or Chris Clegg. Uh, Really good stuff. A great resource to get a lot of your information, especially for Dynasty Leagues. Does a great job of putting you on guys early at every level, a lot of live looks, things like that. Can't endorse Chris enough, so go check that out. In just a minute, I've got a question about some guys in AA that are a little bit old for their level and what they could be in the future. But first, 
Today's episode is brought to you by our friends at eBay Motors for a championship team. It's all about making sure every player is a perfect fit, and it's the same when it comes to your vehicle. Every part has to fit just right. The next time you need parts and accessories, head to eBay Motors. With their guaranteed fit, you can be sure every part you need fits right the first time around. You add your ride to My Garage, look for the green truck mark to know your part will fit or your money back. Because just like in sports, confidence is the name of the game when you shop on eBay Motors. So, with over 120 million parts to choose from, you'll be back in the game in no time. Get the right parts, the right fit, and the right prices on ebaymotors.com. eBay guaranteed fit only available to U.S. customers. Eligible items only. Exclusions do apply. Back to our mailbag episode. Brady in our Discord asked about outfielder Matt Frazier of the Pittsburgh Pirates. 2019 third rounder out of the University of Arizona. One of those guys I mentioned, a little over the level. He's 25 and repeating double A. So he got there at the end of 2021 after most of the season in high A Greensboro. Spent all of 2022 in high A Altoona and really kind of struggled and then has has gone back there for 23. So he's 25 years old again in double A Altoona. 244, 310, 378 is the slash line. Four home runs, 13 extra base hits, 14 walks to 32 strikeouts and four or four on stolen bases. So the story behind Matt Frazier is he's one Frazier spelled differently than you're expecting. F R A I Z E R. It was hard to find in my notes because I was just assuming when he said Frazier, it was the other way around, but completely overhauled his swing. And so went like when he got into pro ball during the pandemic there. And so when he did that 2021 in high a at age 23, mind you, but still was a breakout year in 75 games in 21, 314-401-578, 314 401 578, 20 home runs, 37 extra base hits, like magic slash line we always talk about, right? So, sh- struggled last year, 219, 284, 333. This year, 244, 310, 378. Uh, four home runs, 13 extra base hits. The thing that I've noticed is the swing gets a little too long still, even with the overhaul. He still seems to struggle with the length of the swing. I mean, he's, he's 6'3", 205, so he's not one of those massively bulked people. Uh, it felt like he did try to swing for a little bit more power last year. Didn't completely work out back in AA Altoona. The one positive that I can give you on this, because the power isn't quite there, and he's in a weird place, and I'll get to that in a second. The one positive I can notice crushes lefties, 379, 471, 483, doing a very good job against Southpaws. But the issue that Matt Frazier has, projecting forward, again, we don't, on this show, we don't assume guys aren't going to make it because that is, yes, that is the most likely outcome for any given prospect. But on this show, the approach we take is let's assume this guy's going to make it and figure out going forward how it works. Uh, Matt Frazier's in a really unique place because he doesn't have the power for left field, but even though he's a plus runner and the defense is probably average or so, he doesn't have the arm to play center or right. It's somewhere I've seen 40 grades, I've seen 45 grades, so below average to fringe, things like that. So you're in a really weird scenario where defensively, you don't quite work with the below average arm in center or right, but you don't have the power profile that a team would typically look for out of a left fielder. That's the position where you make that trade-off of defense for power for a lot of teams. So that's a bit of an issue and an obstacle when Matt Frazier advances forward, but first he's got to conquer this double A Altoona thing. Uh, He's got to do better against righties. Just, Uh, And then find some more ways to shorten the swing as well as to incorporate power into the swing a bit more. He actually, after the struggles last year, he actually fell off the top 30 rankings at a lot of the, the, the prospect apparatus after the year he had last year. So more work to be done for Matt Frazier. Again, has tools, just has to figure out the best approach and work on the contact ability with that swing to get them into games. Uh, Jeremy in our Discord, two guys, but another one that fits that same profile of a tweener defensively who uh, who his, feels like he's kind of limited on power at times, Matt Rudick of the New York Mets. 2021 13, 13th rounder out of San Diego State. 44 games in AA Binghamton as a 24-year-old. So not as 
too old for the level, but still, you know, kind of right there in that average age for the level as far as a prospect goes. In his 44 games, 320, 465, 537. There's that magic slash line, right? Seven home runs, 18 extra base hits, 35 walks to 29 strikeouts, 9 to 10 on stolen bases. Uh, he is a short king, listed at 5'6", 170, and it feels like there's been a little bit of cap on the power because of that. Now, again, despite it, he's got seven home runs on the year. Uh, in 155 career games in the minors, his slugging is 414, and he's hit 11 home runs. So the seven this year are more than half of his career total since being drafted in 2021. Uh, he does he does make very good contact. His career batting average in the minors is 268. Again, he's batting 320 this year. It was an adjustment last year in high A Brooklyn. It wasn't a great year, but he obviously has done a lot of work on pitch recognition. Again, walking more times than he struck out this year in the 44 games, 35 walks, 25 strikeouts. So done a lot of positive work there. Uh, the question is, what is the power ceiling going to be? And I think ultimately that may hold him back from being a lineup regular. Uh, the speed is somewhere around average. I've seen some reports below. Uh, not quite sure the, uh, the the caliber of those scouting reports and haven't seen a ton of him myself. So I don't necessarily want to say that he's below average speed. But even if you look at him as like an average speed, the arm isn't great, but he can play all three positions. To me, Matt Rudick feels like his ceiling is going to be a higher average fourth outfielder that can give you decent defense if you bring him in late in a game to cover left for a guy like maybe a Brett Beatty who you have to kick out there because you have other options in the infield, things like that. I like him. Uh, again, I have questions about that power ceiling. I do think as the fourth outfielder, a guy who can play center or right or left, he's a useful piece for a big league roster. I've heard he's a good clubhouse guy. I just don't quite know if the power ceiling's enough to get you to the level of a lineup regular. But again, he's batting 537, or his slugging is 537 this year. So if he has uncovered something new, let's see if that continues. I'd expect him, if he keeps doing like this, especially if they keep calling up guys from the minors to up to the Mets and get that youth movement on the position players going, I would expect him to get bumped to AAA, and we can see how he does there. The other guy that Jeremy asked about, H Jose Peroza, third baseman, 2016 IFA, 37 games right now in AA. So he's also in Binghamton. Uh, 299, 395, 526. Six home runs, 18 extra base hits, 19 walks to 48 strikeouts, two for two on stolen bases. Good and bad here to like. Another guy who's not on prospect lists, he was in the past, isn't there right now. A couple things that he does well, he's good at making hard contact in the air. So, the, I mean, the batting average, obviously very good. He's making quality contact, but it's quality contact and in the air. So it gives you potential to, even if it's caught for an out, you can still advance a guy, things like that, versus somebody who slaps a ground ball into the ground. Uh, he does have some of that power, potential in there still that you can get more of uh, more out of that and defensively the range isn't fantastic but he can play anywhere but short in the infield he can play third he can play first he can play second the arm is plus and so Peroza feels to me like he's gonna end up being a utility infielder for the Mets a guy that crushes lefties he's gonna have big platoon splits but crushes lefties uh, can make solid contact he's like an ideal utility guy, pinch hitter late, you want a little bit of pop, things like that. I think that Jose Perez is going to be a great option for that. It'd be even better if he was a, le a lefty hitter, but either way, still think he's going to be a useful big league piece. And again, one of the better defenders in the infield, despite the range not necessarily being great, can, can play again, first, second, and third. In just a minute, really interesting question about who might be this year's Lars Newtbar, a guy that comes up because they need some help and just never goes back down. And we'll get to that next. But first, today's episode is brought to you by our friends at BetterHelp. It, it's very easy to get caught up in what other people need from you. And never thinking for a minute about what you need for yourself. But when you spend all of your time giving, it can leave you feeling stretched thin 
or burned out. And parents who are listening to this are probably, yes, you're exactly right at the, you know, in their car, in the earbud while they're vacuuming or doing whatever they're doing right now. But therapy can give you tools to find balance in your life so you can understand the ways to support others without leaving yourself behind. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online. It's designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. All you do, you fill out a brief questionnaire. You get matched with a licensed therapist. That relationship does matter. It is an important relationship between you and the therapist. And if for some reason it's not clicking, you can switch therapists at any time for no additional charge. So for to find more balance, use BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash LockedOnMLB today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash LockedOnMLB. Interesting question from a new person to the Discord. Hunter McTwo asked about who is the 2023 version of Lars Newtbar, the guy who gets called up and just never goes down because he ends up being a really useful piece. And he gave two suggestions that are really good suggestions, actually. He kind of answered his own question. So the first the first guy he gave, I'm going to give both of his and I'm going to mention one or two myself. First guy he gave, Spencer Horwitz of the Toronto Blue Jays. So uh, mostly plays first, bat bat first guy. I mean, it's a he's a first baseman, so the defense, you're not necessarily looking for much from him. But... This year, 48 games in Buffalo, 320, 440, 434. Only two home runs, 16 extra base hits, 36 walks to 42 strikeouts, three of four on stolen bases. Uh, makes hard contact, makes quality contact, does it often. The plate discipline is very, very good. Uh, not a like not a pure power home run swing. You can see from the numbers. But not every first baseman has to have that massive slugger profile. Obviously, Vlad Guerrero does. I'm thinking about guys like Nathaniel Lowe or Lau, whichever one it is. I never remember which one he is, uh, of the Texas Rangers. A guy who doesn't hit for massive home run numbers, but very high. Or Vinny Pascantino, another great example of a guy that has plenty of power, but is just a reliable line drive kind of guy. Spencer Horwitz is a guy that has a great combination of those tools. Feels like it could really work. Brandon Belt. Right now is first base dh kind of working behind Vlad Guerrero. I could see when Brandon Belt's done, I can see Horwitz taking that role and never really leaving. If for some reason Vlad Guerrero doesn't stick around, you've also got that there. The other guy that he mentions, another really good name, infielder Coco Montes of the Colorado Rockies. I called him an infielder. He's listed shortstop some places, second base some other places. I think he's going to be a utility guy. 54 games in AAA Albuquerque. He's back there. He spent 111 games there last year. He's back in AAA Albuquerque. 323, 402, 561. 11 home runs, 28 extra base hits, 30 walks to 61 strikeouts, 3 of 7 on stolen bases. Good enough defender in the infield. He can play He can play second. He can play sh- a little bit of short, but he's better as a, as a second baseman. But a guy that just makes consistent qu- contact. I don't love the power. I mean, I think he finished last year with 20 home runs in 126 games, so it's fine. But you get a little bit of help there, obviously, beating cores. Uh, just a, a guy that's just a good baseball player, right? He's not a top 30 prospect. He's not a much like a, a, a super high heralded name, but just a dude who's a good baseball player. Uh, Luke and Baker for the St. Louis Cardinals, he got called up over the weekend. I think his first starts on Sunday, so we don't actually know how that's going. That game was like a the the super early 10:30 Peacock game. So, don't quite know how that is, but another guy, uh drafty in 2018 out of TCU, just rakes. I want to say this year 313, 434, 641 in AAA Memphis. 18 home runs and 29 extra base hits. 43 walks to 53 strikeouts. Feels like he's a great candidate to stick around at DH for the Cardinals. Now you have to fight Alec Burleson and Juan Yepes for playing time at DH, but Nolan Gorman's pretty much locked down second base now. Obviously, you've got Arenado and Goldschmidt on the corners. Gorman can spell Arenado at third. Goldschmidt, I believe, might be on the last year of his deal or has an opt-out after this season, but either way, you can see Luke and Baker uh, take some, some time away, or not take some time, but back up Goldschmidt a bit if they give they Goldschmidt a day off, things like that. He can play some first. He can DH. The dude just mashes. Uh, one more guy, and defensively, it's a little bit harder to fit him in this, 
but Justin Henry Malloy of the Detroit Tigers. 2021 sixth rounder at Georgia Tech by Atlanta. They traded him. I want to say that was the Joe Jimenez deal is when he went from Atlanta to the to the Tigers. But 54 games in AAA, 276, 421, 448. Eight home runs, 17 extra base hits, 43 walks to 63 strikeouts, one for two on stolen bases. Very low chase for Justin Henry Malloy. Contact ability is really good. The raw power is above average or plus, but for some reason he doesn't play it in games. It's His home run numbers have gone down. Just to, His power production has gone down just about every level he's gone to. It's there. The raw power is there. It just plays down in games. If you can work on some of the some of the swing and miss, you saw the strikeout numbers, uh, 63 strikeouts in 54 games. If he can work out a little bit of that swing and miss, he's a guy that isn't going to be great defensively, but he can cover third base. He has an above average arm. He can cover. He's played some left field. The speed's not great, but everything else is there. Uh, obviously, he can play some first base as well. And then just has like great hitting ability, great zone control, and can be somebody who you can have up. You can plug into your lineup a couple days a week. You can platoon him. You can have him play multiple positions. He can be a key guy off the bench. Another guy that I feel like he's going to come up and he'll be useful enough to just hold a job for six years before you even realize that, oh, hey, he's been up the whole entire time and hasn't gone down. Just a couple minor things to tweak and fix in AAA. Interesting question from Greenlight on Twitter. Why do pitchers throw majority fastballs if it's less effective? And he's referencing a, when I was talking about CSW, called strikes plus whiffs, and I mentioned that uh, your goal is 30% for the arsenal, but fastballs are usually below 30%, and breaking pitches and off-speed are above that. And so why do most pitchers stick with majority fastball if it's not as effective as the breaking in the off speed. He asked if it's strain on the arm or things like that. And what's really interesting is you're seeing that change. 20 years ago, 65% fastballs was the norm. 2022 was the first year where you saw more non-fastballs thrown than fastballs. And so it was always called working backwards, where you would use your off speeds and your breaking pitches to set up the fastball. And that's kind of become the norm now. Because if you think about a lot of guys when they're taking batting practice, if they're using a hitting machine, things like that, unless they've got one of the advanced machines, they're seeing fastballs. They're hitting fastballs. And so guys see fastballs a lot more. Uh, The fastballs typically have less dramatic movement. And it's easier to time up a pitch than it is to compensate for the movement of a pitch. So it's more reliable to miss the bat altogether than to try to get past the bat before they can hit it, if that makes sense. It's kind of a weird way of explaining it. But because teams have noticed this kind of stuff, a lot of pitchers now throw less fastballs than they used to, and they throw more breaking stuff, more off-speed stuff. The game is changing. I guess this is another way where analytics has changed the game. As we've gotten all this advanced data, teams have realized, hey, Rather than just giving you having a four a four seam fastball that has good carry up in the zone, you're gonna throw 65% of the time. Maybe we're gonna change your fastball to a cutter or a two seamer that has more natural movement on it, one direction or the other. And we're gonna have you throw secondaries a lot more. This vertically breaking curveball that drops under a bat, or this slider that dives down and away from hitters. That's kind of how the game's evolved. And so for the most part now, pitchers don't throw majority fastball anymore. Uh, it's n- Now, there's always exceptions to this, mind you, outing to outing from pitchers or uh, pitcher to pitcher. Some guys just trust their fastballs more or don't have breaking stuff that's as good. And I still think that rookie pitchers, the ones that seem to be more successful are when they have a really good fastball. Although some of the uh, some of the Mariners guys have had really good fastballs and not much of anything else, and they've struggled a little bit. So... Uh, Interesting to see where the game has changed and how it keeps changing. Fantastic week coming up this week. Reminder, if you have questions for the show, I'm on Twitter at Crosby Baseball. Show's on Twitter at Locked On Farm. You can email us, LockedOnMLBProspects at gmail.com, or drop your questions in the Locked On MLB Prospects Discord. Links in the episode description. Links in the show notes. Until tomorrow's show, remember, it's always a great time to pay a minor leaguer. (laughs) 